This is Smart Poker Study episode 174, an interview with poker coach and author Peter Clark. I hope you caught the Q&A episode number 173, where I pontificated on limping in the small blind and essential HUD stats. It's poker study time, y'all. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode. I love that you share the show, you tweet your tweets, and you subscribe to the podcast. I also love my Patreon supporters, and we have a new one to introduce this week. His name is Orlando Imperio. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon, Orlando. And of course, everyone else who's continuing their support with this brand new month. February just now hit, um, you know, one twelfth of the, of the way into 2018. And so far, things are looking up. So uh, I love creating this weekly show for y'all. And the time that I spend creating it is supported by everyone on Patreon. Your support shows me that you enjoy the show and that you want me to keep doing this forever. To start your own support on the show, go to Patreon. Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash smart poker study. There are different levels of support with different rewards attached. And speaking of rewards, because uh, February, brand new month just started, I've got some February rewards coming out pretty darn soon. This month's reward podcast is going to be about calling three bets. I'll give you some new stats to use to gauge your opponent's three bet ranges. And I'll tell you the important things to consider before you click that call button. I'll also go over your post flop options in three bet pots when you are the uh, pre flop caller. And in this month's video, I'm going to show you how I analyze river missed value spots. If you heard that MED Monday episode I did, uh, well, earlier this week, I read an article from Alex Fitzgerald, and he talked about just how important it is to get value on the river. And he said, you should be super pissed at yourself if you do not uh, bet, or I'm sorry, yeah, you should be pissed at yourself if you check behind on the river with the best hand. You basically just missed out on value right there. So I'm going to show you how to go through your database to, to find those hands to figure out why you didn't make the bet. So hopefully the next time when the situation occurs, or a similar situation, you actually get some value, even if it's just two big blinds. I mean, if you do that, you know, one out of every 100 hands, that's an extra two big blinds you're adding to your win rate. So I really think that uh, this month's February's Patreon uh, podcast reward and the training video reward are going to really help my Patreon supporters be better players. So if you want to support, go to the show notes or of course, patreon.com slash smart poker study. Alrighty, it is interview time. You might already know my guest uh, and the incredible books that he's written. Uh, his name is Peter Clark, and he's a longtime poker player. He's an ex-professional player, now full-time poker coach, and he's also uh, the author of a book called The Grinder's Manual and another one called 100 Hands. I'm sure many of you know who this guy is. Uh, we talk a ton of stuff in today's episode, and I'm sure that you've already seen it's a pretty darn long episode, but Peter really delivers some incredibly valuable words of wisdom. So please visit the show notes page for everything we discussed today, along with screenshots and links to all of Peter's stuff. Uh, the show notes page, of course, is www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod 174. Okay, it is that time. Gambate! This is damn exciting stuff. We have a special guest on today's episode. Peter Clark is here to talk all things micro stakes. He's a longtime poker player and coach. And actually, I've been listening to this guy, his podcast from Grinder School and his Carrot Poker podcast for quite some time. He's also authored two different books. The first was The Grinder's Manual, and the second book is called 100 Hands. We're going to be discussing all of that and a whole lot more today. So without further ado, welcome to the podcast, Peter. Thanks very much, guys. Great to be here. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, thank you. I'm really, I'm really happy to have you. Like I said, I've been listening to you forever, and your poker content, your strategy content, your your poker mindset stuff, it's just so valuable. I found so much value, so I'm really happy that I have this opportunity to introduce you to a lot of my podcasts who, I mean, who knows if they know you or not, but if they don't know you, they're going to know you now. Yeah, no, that was a nice surprise when we chatted there, and you said I, that you'd been following me since, like, Grinder School, like to me, when I was working on Grinder School, the site it doesn't really exist anymore as such. But I was like a kid, and I was like kind of so like unprofessional and unserious about the game, and I would just rant and swear all through the videos and things like that. So it's kind of funny. It's kind of nostalgic. Like I guess the content was maybe still alright, but I guess 
I've evolved a fair, matured, I guess you could say, a fair bit since then. Yeah, so. absolutely. You have listening to your current podcast, um, uh, Carrot Poker Podcast. You're definitely much different than when you were back then. But like I've been listening to you, so you can think about it. You were growing back then. Like you said, you were a kid doing those podcasts. I was growing right. too within the poker realm. I think I'm a little bit older than you. I'm 40 years old right now. But at the time when I was listening to you, I was a, a, a poker newbie, you know? So I was mm -hmm. learning a ton of stuff, even if you were you know, 25% of the player and the coach you are now, the stuff that you yeah. were talking about at the time was very valuable to me. So thank you very much for all of that free content you gave. That is all good. It's really funny, actually. Really strange tangent, but I was, like I told you, I had a little sleep there before we did this interview because I'd done a bunch of work really early today. And I had this dream that I was still making videos in grinder school and I was recording so much music over the video that I could barely even, like, no one could hear me and I was getting all this bad feedback and stuff. And I was like, that's a weird dream. Because I haven't thought about grinder school for quite some time, you know, but it's funny. Yeah, you do You do definitely go on a journey, don't you, as a poker player and you sort of learn and grow and evolve. Then you look back a few years later and you're like, wow, was I really... Was I really that poker player slash coach? Yeah, absolutely. You go through that. And I'm still on that. Like, I've always felt, I don't think I'll ever be, like, you know, like they say the greats in the game are like Isaac Haxton or Phil Ivey. Um, I don't think I will ever be at their level. I think there's always more to learn. Um, and I, I would bet even from their perspective, they're always learning as well. Yeah, well, I was teaching a student actually last night, one of my private students who is one of the better backgammon players like in the US scene right now. Mm -hmm. So obviously very intelligent, like strategically minded guy. I won't name him just in case he doesn't want the embarrassment. But um, he was basically saying, he was like, my goal is to crush Phil Galfond. Like my goal is to crush <laughs> the best the best players in the world. I, I probably won't get there, but that's still my goal and it's a pretty good goal. So is, yeah. I think that, that made a lot of sense to me. You know, that's something that, because I always taught, like, make your goals realistic and, you know, be practical and don't be results oriented And all these things are great. But just setting the bar so high in terms of motivation, I think that's really cool if that inspires you, you know. I agree, too. That's I don't think I'm like I do like to make, you know, have you ever heard of the term BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals? I have now and I like it. Yeah, yeah. So that's what that's what your student made right there. That's a that's a hairy, audacious goal. I don't think I would ever make that kind of goal, but I I my kind of goal is like I could definitely see myself playing five ten live and very proficiently and as mm -hmm. well as like, you know, two hundred, four hundred online. I can definitely uh get to that point at some time. But beating Phil Galfond, I don't know, man. He just him and like those other names I mentioned, they just seem way too up there for me. Yeah, no, it's, it's literally like saying I'm going to be one of the best um, players in the world, especially if you're then playing him at PLO, which is now a specialty. But yeah, it's um, I think it's good as long as you have like you're realistic enough to say this is just something to look at, to inspire me and to aim for. And if I do happen to get there, then fantastic. That's amazing. But if I get anywhere even like 5% close, then I'll be happy at the end of the day. So, you know, I think it's that kind of thing to set the bar so high that it inspires you, but not get upset if you don't actually meet that goal totally 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 i agree with you there so uh, i want to first ask about what are your poker origins when did you start playing how did you play what stakes did you start at and kind of your journey up to where you got till now um right so my story is not very standard because i didn't like explode onto the scene and suddenly like start crushing some high stake online like a lot of you know famous successful players coaches do um not that i think i'm that famous but anyway so i started off um actually just playing on a Thursday evening while I was still in high school with friends and we played five card draw um, and we just played lots of five card draw and we actually played this weird format where you played five card draw first of all and your position in the five card draw tournament determined your starting stack in a no limit tournament no limit holding tournament afterwards and it was really fun and we used to play all night and stuff like that and um, that's how I fell in love with the game and then started like you know trying to find as much info as I could but this was before there was any good info, you know. So I guess I put it on the back burner for a while. And then when I was a few years later, when I was about um, 21, 22, I decided, when I was 21, actually, I decided I'm going to be a professional poker player because I'd won a few cash games and tournaments at the casino where I used to work at with the staff. And I thought because I could beat those guys that I must be an incredible kind of poker prodigy or something like that, obviously, right? That's natural. So um, I wasn't. And, you know, I made loads of mistakes, but at that point, I still had the kind of ego. You might have heard the story before, but following the ground of school stuff, mm -hmm. but I had the kind of ego where I thought I was already good. I remember being drunk and saying to a friend one night, I am the best poker player in the world. <laughs> and he said, no, you're not. 
And I was like, yes, I am. So that was like my shameful past, like 20 year old self. Um, then I joined a place called flopturnedriver.com, which is pretty stagnant these days, but it was a really good community. And actually you may know guys like in the audience as well, may know guys like, um, um, Ben Selsky, sauce one, two, three, mm-hmm. for instance, or Natsinho. Um, these are some players from like way back in the day. Some of them still exist now. Like Ben, for example, still makes really high stakes heads up content, um, on run at once and things like that. And these guys were on there in this community and it was a kind of golden era because no one had discovered just how immensely profitable like video training sites were to run. So these guys were just working on their game and they were also dropping in and as their poker kind of workouts, they were giving advice to guys like me who hadn't, who were just nobodies. And they would come on my threads and be like, your play's terrible because of X, Y, and Z. And at first I was like, you know, that's so mean, I don't like you kind of thing. And then as I grew up a little bit, I was kind of like, wait, actually, if I read your logic, what you say makes so much sense and maybe I need to revise everything. So it was kind of humbling because I kind of fell, my idea of myself, my self-image kind of fell from like the sky where it didn't belong down to where it actually was, which was just a kid like starting off with some natural talent, but very unhoned, you know? Mm-hmm. So what happened next was that I started to embrace the whole culture of I am a massive fish. And I think around like 2009, 2010, there was this movement within the poker learning world that was like, admit admitting you're a huge fish is cool because it shows that you don't have an ego problem, right? So I jumped on that bandwagon. I was like, I'm a huge fish and, you know, I need I need help, almost like a help group or something like that where you'd introduce yourself. And I ended up just slowly getting a lot better well quite quickly actually when i had the right attitude i should say it was quite fast all i had to do was get the ego roadblock out of the way and then i started a journey up through like 25 50 nl 100 nl 200 and had just a great year where i made enough money to like just suddenly like i had money i was i was like a college kid so i didn't have anything going for them suddenly i had some money enough to like you know go to vegas and play there and book nice hotels and just sort of enjoy life a little bit um so that was cool and after that, I got into coaching for a grinder school, like you mentioned, which is the first place I ever worked. And they were affiliated at the time with Flopturn River, that excellent kind of place back in the day where the pros would hand out the knowledge for free. Um, so on grinder school, I made a bunch of videos. And honestly, like what actually made me as a poker thinker and a poker player and just a poker kind of person in general was just coaching. Because by explaining and articulating everything you can to someone else, and actually, like the way I coach is I put everything into that and I try and solve stuff. If I'm not, if I don't know how to solve a spot, I'll say to a student, like, I don't know what to do here, so let's solve it together. I won't say, oh, this is just give them some kind of, um, you know, fabricated advice. So because I was solving all the time when I was coaching and I was just talking with some really good players, when I got a better, became a better coach, stronger and stronger players were hiring me for like private coaching. And by talking to them, that was really the making of me. And it was weird because I was I was kind of at a crossroads where on the one hand, I could have tried to play lots of poker, move up through the stakes, like crush high stakes. And I felt I had a shot at it if I really wanted to. But honestly, it made me unhappy. Like being a full-time poker player, and I did it for a few years, kind of made me stressed out. I guess I don't have the mental fortitude to sit in the house all day and not interact with people and just play poker. I found it isolating and I found that my mental game suffered because of the environment of just being alone and grinding. And I guess I wasn't very good then at balancing life with poker and going to the gym and going out and doing social things. I was just obsessive. So because of that, I chose the coaching path, which was becoming better and better. And I was finding it easier and easier to find ways to make money. And then from there, I remember I was on a flight one day. I'd been at like a, a poker meetup with some of my students on the Carrot Corner Forum, um, which is where my students congregate. And I was on a, on a flight back home and I just had this, I just looked out the window and I was, I don't know if you know that way when you look at something beautiful like a sunset or whatever, and it kind of gets you thinking, it gets your brain going and you start considering things. And I was like, I should write a book. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write like the Bible of online six max cash. I'm going to try to write that and I'm going to, you know, not miss anything out. And I want to make a book that's never been made before. And then since then, now I guess I'm better known as an author than anything else probably. But that's really cool because I've always liked writing and I always kind of was torn between like, do I want to become an author? Or do I want to become a poker person? And now I kind of managed to become both. So that's me kind of, that was, that. was those were my goals, right? They weren't like crush at the high stakes. They became more like, how can I be the best teacher and writer of this game that I possibly can? And I guess that's how I got to where I am today. Nice, man. Nice. You know, a couple things that I want to I want to pull out of that right there. Um, so I really like how you had, you know, 
when you were on the forums and posting hands and stuff, and then some of these great players like Ben Solsky would kind of critique and criticize your plays, you first had that uh, that attitude of, hey, dude, shut up. You don't know me. My play was yeah. right. Whatever. I'm not listening to you. But then I really like how you eventually kind of started to change and, and maybe their approach, maybe their the way they said things wasn't nice, but the content um, of what they gave you was valid. And, and I like how, you know, you kind of put your ego to the side eventually at one point and, um, you know, started to pull out those nuggets of wisdom and then dive into that and use those to improve your game and not get so butthurt over things, you know? Yeah, exactly. And I think like, like human beings, they don't like peak mentally. They're not in the best mental, they're not of the best mental constitution, I should say, when they're like 21 years old, right? They're kind of all over the place. And we don't know what we're doing as humans or poker players then. We just mess up a lot. So we've not really found ourselves yet. So I guess, like, that's fine. You have to go through that process as a poker player and as a human. So even if you're older when you start playing the game, you still have to go through that same evolution where you have the wrong attitude for a while before you get the right one. Um, so I just wish it could have happened a bit quicker with me because I spent years thinking I was the greatest when I wasn't, you know. <laughs> so let that be a lesson to anyone out there that thinks that they're the greatest. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, the other thing that I really took out of that was I really liked how you said when you're coaching and you come across a problem uh, that you just don't know the answer to, I really like how you, you're just honest and straight up with your students to say, I do not know this, but let's figure out it together. I love that. Like when teachers or coaches act like they know everything, um, and uh, it's just, it's just really not the best way to go. You know, when you're teaching, you're learning at the same time. And when you're a coach or a teacher, you don't, I mean, I mean your students maybe hope that you know everything and they expect right. you to know and be able to answer everything, but it makes sense. And it makes you totally more, uh, j just more human when you are able to admit that I don't know this, but let's figure it out together. I love that attitude. Yeah. And the cool thing is as well that when you become good enough at like GTO and stuff like that, you actually get like a framework that allows you to solve anything. So it's not that something, I mean, a really complicated question could be, for instance, like not solvable by me, but almost every question I'm going to find when I'm coaching, I at least know that I have the tools to get to the answer and it'll be quite quick and efficient. And I can take my student with me on that journey and he can see how I'm coming to that answer, how I'm arriving there. So that's the great thing about the modern kind of poker um, revolution where we got into like GTO and stuff like that. And we were able to say, these are actually the nuts and bolts. And if you start here, you can pretty much solve everything with enough time and effort. And I really like that about the game. Absolutely. Yeah. What, when you're walking through these things with your students, what kind of softwares are you using? Are you using card runners EV or flopzilla or PO solver? Generally, yeah, I mean, I like to keep it very simple, and I like the GTO that I teach to be applicable. So you know how, like, PO Solver will basically mix the strategies all the time. So, for example, right, for anyone who doesn't know what PIO is about, like, it tries to solve the game exactly. So it tries to say that this is the optimal resolution for one completely perfect player playing against another completely perfect player, and this is how they reach the equilibrium where neither can make any exploitative adjustment to profit anymore. So the way it does that is it mixes strategies because there aren't actually enough combinations in No Limit Hold'em for you just to like play Ace-King this way and play Ace-Jack this way. You have to mix your range in order to create the right frequencies in the right spot if you want to like actually hit upon something close to a solved version of the game. So what it'll do is it'll say, <clears throat> on this flop, um, when I have 8-7 suited, I'm going to call it 63% of the time and I'm going to raise with it 37% of the time and obviously I don't know that that's what it's going to say nor does anyone really they just have a vague sense mm -hmm. so instead of like taking my student through an actual simulation I guess I get my pile stuff like third hand where I, I see it other coaches doing it and then I actually learn what its habits and tendencies are and why it does them and then I can approximate it and say this hand technically is going to be a bet it's going to be a call a decent amount of time and it will have some raising frequency because of x y and z factors but actually in this player pool people overfold their range against raises on the flop therefore it's probably better to it's probably fine to just raise this kind of combo all of the time on this texture where you have like the gut shot with the with the two over cards or whatever it happens to be mm -hmm. so yeah i like to make like i did when i wrote my book 100 hands which i know we're going to talk about later but um in that book it was all about i want to address gto i want to like tackle it but I want to make it applicable. So the only tools I really use would be PT4, which I consider like that for me is just like pen and paper. That's how used to it I am. I can just sort of be really fast with it. And um, just equity solvers and range builders. Poker Ranger is quite good, like color coding ranges and just building strategies and mainly just 
PowerPoint. I'm very big on PowerPoint because I'm very big on how to teach the game and how to make it visually make sense for my student, not just rant at them for like an hour, like some coaches might have done or I might have done even when I first started out. Gotcha. So when it, when it comes to actual coaching <laughs> sessions, you actually have PowerPoint slides already prepared ahead of time? Like Not necessarily. Sometimes we build them on the fly so the student will want to work on a certain thing. And instead of actually showing them something I've already built, I might do if it fits perfectly. But here's the thing about poker students. They're all completely different. Yes. And they all have different gaps, different holes, because one guy watched X, Y, and Z coaches and picked up, you know, 95 good habits and 10 bad ones from them. And another student watched like a different array of like 100 coaches in his time and picked up a total different set of good and bad habits. So what I like to do, since they're all so different, is actually go through PowerPoint and ask the student, what would you do here? What are your thoughts here? And then build a presentation for them that captures the right elements of that topic that they're working on. So I love interactively building PowerPoints with the student as we go and getting their input on it so I know exactly what to put in it. So that's my main tool. And then obviously using other bits of software where needed to, to sort of help like equity calculators and things. But I think there's just so much you can do with, I think visual teaching is so underdone in poker. I think it could be just done to such a better extent. And that's one of the weaknesses of the poker teaching world is that no one presents things like real teachers. And that's what inspired me to try and fill that gap. Awesome. I love that. You know, when I, when I do my coaching with my students, um, you know, we'll have poker tracker four uh, or flopzilla or and flopzilla open and then look at hands and stuff and go through database, find leaks and everything. But what I always do is I just use a word document. And as I, as I'm telling them things, I'm taking notes for them. I show them on the screen, the notes I'm taking and I send it to them afterwards. But I really like your whole, like creating slides for them and maybe like do you even take screenshots and copy and yep. paste them in and then explain your reasoning explain what you're doing within those powerpoint slides right well in 2018 actually um i was having a little break over the winter and while i was like walking the dogs one day i just sort of thought i need to make my coaching a bit better when i come back to coaching because i got you know when you do something about too much you can lose like your passion for it and that's a real shame when that happens you get into a rut get a bit bogged down in the same routine so i was like how do I organize this in a nicer way for the student and for me? And I decided that every student has their own continuous PowerPoint that starts off with like their focus areas, their main leaks, just like you were talking about with your students where you diagnose like using stats, where their leaks are, then you filter for hands as the treatment, as the medicine. I do all of that, but put down like a list of the leaks in the PowerPoint, that's the start of it. And then say we do 25 sessions together, that will just grow and the PowerPoint will become longer and longer and have different parts parts of it just building as we go so now on my desktop i've actually got like a huge array of just the student's name and then like powerpoint file and i can just click that up with that student um when i do a call with that student i can remember exactly what we did last and i can have them all different themes and stuff like that it just keeps me really super like stoked about about teaching if i can make it nice to look at all day i, I felt like with microsoft word because i wrote the greatest manual on it and that was a huge mistake that cost me endless amounts of time trying to convert it into a kindle after that and that i just find that powerpoint is just there's so much more you can do with it you know that you can't do in a word doc absolutely you know it, i i have my uh i have my poker coaching hat on right now but i also have like my poker um poker business hat on and yeah if you have that many powerpoints you have three or four courses already ready for you to put together and and to start give to the public yeah absolutely and that's actually one thing i might be I might try to do this year, I think I will at some point, is build video courses that I can actually sell from my website that really target specific areas of the game. Absolutely. I think that'd be cool. Absolutely. No maybe. You've got to do that. Yeah, yeah no that's, that's fun. Yeah, no mites and no shoulds. Don't should on me. I mean, that's a great idea. You've got to make it. You've <laughs> all right, all right. Convince me. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I, I promise unless something major happens, there'll be a course of some sort by the end of the year. How about that? Sweet. Yeah, and I would love to have you back on the podcast when you do get that created. Cool. Sounds good. Awesome. So um, when it comes to coaching, so I really love the whole PowerPoint creation idea of uh, their own PowerPoint for all that they've learned, all their leaks, fixing all that kind of stuff. When it comes to like the first two or three sessions with a brand new student, what do you do in those beginning sessions? Well, the first one follows a kind of, the first one I make an hour and a half. So one thing that I do in my coaching packages is that when you first buy a package, you get a free half hour as part of your first lesson. It's like a thank you for buying a package from me, choosing me as your coach. And it also is multi-purpose because it gives us extra time in that first lesson, whereas you'll definitely know yourself, there is so much to cover in the first lesson, it's mm -hmm. almost impossible, right? Yes. So the first lesson, I don't go into anything specific. I try and map out what the student's leaks are. 
And I do that in two ways. Like, firstly, we have a chat and I ask them a series of not set questions that I read from a forum, but ones that I need to know about most people, such as to what extent do you feel that emotions interfere during play and what have you done to tackle that? Or, for example, um, what have been your biggest roadblocks technically? What concepts have confused you? Do you feel you've learned you've taken in enough info or too much info? Stuff like this. Um, and that gives me a feel for what that student's like. And then the second thing we do is we just do a massive stats report from a recent sample where I go over a lot of stats, explain what stats are off, like why the student isn't winning. That's really that phase. And in the first like two to three lessons after that first longer one, um, we'll typically keep the other ones to an hour because that's a nice time to focus for. I don't want to focus for any longer than that when you're learning something really complicated. Um, so in the next couple of hours, we will start to tackle what I deem to be the most um I guess you could say urgent leaks and that they would cost the student the most in the short term. Like there are bigger roadblocks that are stopping that person from winning. So we'll tackle those by hand review, building the PowerPoint, theoretical visualization with, with like slides and stuff, and then um, just homework, essentially. And we go from there. And it depends like like how quickly you're going to get through that. Like If you make loads of progress and you can assimilate that really easily, then we can move on. But like if I find that a student has not done the homework, doesn't actually understand what we talked about the last week, and it's worse than the previous week, which can happen mm -hmm. as much as I hate that as a coach, then I'm going to go back and I'm going to make sure that we, we plug that leak again. Like I'm not happy to move on generally until I think the student's actually able to apply a lot of the stuff that we've done. And that's another thing, as you'll know, like learning something and then being able to apply it when they're playing, huge battle, really difficult struggle for any coach that is. Absolutely. It is. Well, it's just hard for any of us as we're reading a poker book and it's really tough to put the stuff that we're reading it unless we do some like dedicated purposeful practice on it. it. It's tough to take the stuff that people are telling you or reading and put it into action. So it, it takes a dedicated mindset to do that. And it probably takes a just basically a student's mindset, somebody who's willing to learn, not somebody who's just getting coaching because they feel they should, but people who are really willing to put the time in. Yeah, you get like a certain kind of fallacy with students, which is like, if I buy X hours, I will automatically become like a really good player. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that we have to bust as coaches. You know, we have to say that's nonsense. It's actually all on you and I'm just your guide. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. When, when it comes to plugging the technical leaks, you know, that's showing them hands, explaining them what a better strategy is, bet sizing, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Um, but when it comes to mental leaks of your, mm -hmm. of your students, how do you tackle those really? Right, so I've developed my own kind of system. I say it's my own. It is, or at least was, very, very closely based on Jared Hendler, who, as far as I'm concerned, is like the leading guy when it comes to like poker mental game when he wrote that book, um, The Mental Game of Poker, which I would definitely recommend to anyone who's interested in a mental game course. Um, so I started with that, and I, showed, I just told people, read that book and try the process that he uses in there, which I won't go into in detail now because it's quite long and complicated. But what I did was I built something like that. But I built something that was maybe that I felt I could do with people in a coaching session like quite quickly and I could get them to just practice on their own. And then I built, um, again, you won't be surprised to hear that I made it into a PowerPoint again. And so <laughs> um, I made an episode on um, Poker Star School where episode 10 of the series I did, which was quite a light, lightish intro to Six Max Cash. Episode 10 was about the mental game. So I made a PowerPoint on there and I, I basically take them through that and just show them this kind of slightly adapted Jared Tendler-esque Jared um, approach that's all to do with accountability and seeing tilt as a subconscious leak that is misfiring or even a good subconscious habit, mm. such as being angry when someone comes into your house and takes your TV, right? That would make you mad. And it should make you mad because you've been burgled and that's not fair and that someone's wronged you. But in poker, that same instinct of this guy just took my television misfires when someone sucks out on you in the river and that is a misfiring because it's not helpful in that second situation in the real life situation it's great because it gets you to call the police or chase the guy down or whatever your style is but you have to do something about it right but in the second one you shouldn't try to do anything about it but it misfires and tries to make you like go on tilt so really just to cut a long story short here the the mechanism i use is all about it's called r.i.p right where Sounds a bit morbid, but R is recognize, I is interrupt, and P is practice um, good logic, good thoughts. So basically, you want to always know when your tilt is happening so that you can call it something and you know the symptoms, just like much like if you had a medical condition, um, a physical condition, you'd want to know what the symptoms were in case you were having a flare-up of it and you could get it treated. Um, so it's like that with tilt. What are your symptoms and can you recognize them in-game and sort of put yourself out with your in-game self and sort of just say mindfully, 
I am experiencing this sort of tail right now, and you've got an idea why it happens. Second thing is to um, interrupt it, so to stop the bad habit, because tilt is a habit. It is literally just something we've learned to do in life, and we carry it over to poker. We have to interrupt that habit to form a new one, and the P of our IP is practice good logic, and that's where the best man to explain that would be Jared Tendler, but he does something called logical injection, where you have a short, snappy phrase that you can put into your mental game. Um, for example, if you're really worried about monsters under the bed, like losing big hands all the time, and you always think they've got the nuts, it could just be something like very simple, such as, I win a lot of money in, by making thin value bets, or something like that. Thin value bets equal money, or whatever. Just something, I'm not very good at forming them, he'd be better, but something like specific to you that would like inspire you to to see the truth to see through the tilt see through the mist of tilt and make the better decision and snap out of it really so that's my approach to it but it's tough you know it's probably the hardest part of coaching yeah totally it is because yeah and no well for, for me it's tough because i feel that i'm still a newbie in the whole mental game and i'm working on my own i still get angry and i still tilt occasionally so trying to help right. my students with that um it's basically just i'm a work in progress so i'm just helping them as best i can and i do the same thing i recommend um <clears throat> excuse me i recommend jared tendler's book as well as dr trisha Cardner's book mm-hmm. because they both just really great content and that's what's really helping me just for my own mental mental game issues yeah Definitely. I mean, I've, I've always had mental game issues. They're a bit better these days, but a lot better than they were once. I always tell the story of like me sitting in my house and playing poker and just getting so mad at myself for making bad calls. That I like slapped myself in the face. Like I never forget that day. Like you don't really forget it when you slap yourself in the face, you know, it's <laughs> such a weird thing to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's other stories. Like I remember one I read a long time ago where a guy like actually plunged a knife into his leg because he was so tilted. Yeah pretty nasty um it was on two plus two for a while pictures and everything grim um yeah maybe you can still find it i've never gotten that bad i've never hit myself i've never broken a mouse either but i've gotten so bad to where like my whole body tenses up and right i if if i would have seen a picture of that i bet my face is beat red and i just probably evil and angry and and just demonic i bet and what state is your poker thought process in when you're exhibiting those symptoms you know probably a total total disarray right yep, yep. so um just go on yes tilt and you're just absolutely and jamming and three betting and calling when you shouldn't and you just end up losing two or three extra stacks for that one yep. stack that tilted you however poker is not buddhism right so you don't have to be completely zen expert in meditation like you don't have to have all of the mental game virtues to teach others right poker is a game where if i'm currently calm I can talk on a really high level with you about tilt. And even if I'm not good at, like, necessarily an expert at managing my own tilt, if I'm in a calm, non-tilted state, I can show you how to manage yours. So that all goes back to the thing I always say, which is do as I say, not as I do, which is very important. If students just copied me throughout the year exactly, they would probably be really tilted, you know. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you just, you just got to learn to, um, like, I know what works. Applying it is hard, um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too harsh on yourself, you know, just because you're a work in progress. I don't think that stops us from being able to teach our students how to work on their mental game. Today's podcast with Peter Clark is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash smartpokerstudy. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And of course, you can play them directly on your computer as well. Um, They also have both of my books, How to Study Poker, Volumes 1 and 2. And if you're looking for an audiobook outside of the poker world, they have all of Matthew Riley's books. Now, Matthew Riley is just such an incredible author. Uh, They're all fiction books, of course. Lots of action, daring do, crazy adventures kind of a stuff. Two of his biggest characters are Jack West Jr. and then Shane Scarecrow Scope field of course and they're just incredible if you want an action-packed book a book that kind of like reads like a movie i highly recommend anything by matthew riley so go to audibletrial.com slash smart poker study to get your free audiobook and start your free trial And two shout-outs today 
Carlos Vignoli purchased Poker Tracker 4 through my link. He is using this to upgrade his game, take himself to the next level, take advantage of all those online players, find and exploit their weakness. Good on you, Carlos. And of course, Pedro Contreras purchased the How to Study Poker webinar. So he's going to use what I teach him there to hit the books and hit them hard, improve his game by finding his own leaks, his own weaknesses, studying his opponent's leaks and weaknesses, and his game is going to be all all the better for it. So if you'd like to purchase the How to Study Poker webinar, or of course, Poker Tracker 4, just go to the show notes page for today's uh, episode. Alrighty, back to Peter Clark. I want to get to the grinders manual now. Now, like you had said, this is the Bible for six max online cash. And you know, going through it, Everything, I mean, while you say it's intended for six max cash, it is totally for just anybody wanting to improve their game. When you talk about specific stats and using HUDs and stuff, maybe that's not applicable to live games so much. But still, mm -hmm. all of the ideas in there, whether it's, um, you know, whether it is technologically driven like HUDs and stats and Poker Tracker 4, or just skill wise, different strategies to use, they're available for. Uh, they'd just be great for anybody to learn. So I really recommend this book and I love that you wrote it. How do you recommend that somebody actually study this book? Because a lot of people just pick up a poker book and your book is pretty darn, well, I, I would say hefty, but it's not a physical book. It's a Kindle, tons of pages. It's really long, but if you read it, you could probably read it two hours a day, finish it in a week or so, but then you don't actually you're not putting everything to use. You're not learning as much as you should. How do you recommend somebody study your book? Yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of people study it the wrong way. So when I first wrote it, I was like, read my book and then we'll do coaching. And that didn't work because it was a bit like saying to someone like, read this encyclopedia and then you'll know everything about the world. Like you won't retain everything, right? It's yep. kind of crazy. So <laughs> what you actually have to do with Grinder's Manual, and this actually um, it's kind of like a double-edged sword for me. Um, you actually have to go over it many, many times. So when I published 100 Hands, my next book, um, I remember thinking like, why are so many people that bought Grinder's Manual not buying this yet? Because they all liked Grinder's Manual. I mean, it got very good feedback, just objectively speaking. So I was kind of perplexed. Then I realized that actually they're all going through it for like the fifth time and that's what they should be doing because it's such a dense book. So I don't know if I like, cut myself out of making some money there by not making it quick to read but I don't regret that anyway it's it's a huge book and the answer is that the sensible students who will actually incorporate the knowledge of the book will go over chapters time and time again they will take notes they will one student even made his own summary of the book and the summary was about 150 pages because wow. the book's like 560 pages mm -hmm. so you know you'd have to then make a summary of the summary to get it smaller it's that kind of book so you do have to go over it again like I've always said Grinder's Manual, I always wanted it to be a textbook. I didn't want it to just be like old school poker books from like, you know, 1999 where the author's just like, oh, one time at this table I did this and, you know, my friend said I should maybe have done this, but I decided to do this anyway. I wanted to avoid the terribly written, very informal poker book as much as possible and create something just like it was a course at university, what would be the main text for that course. That's what I wanted to build. But in doing so, I definitely built something you have to go over many times and treat like it's an academic text, not like it's just a fun read. Yeah, absolutely. If if somebody was, okay, so, you know, uh, micro stakes, there's 2NL, 5NL, 10NL, 25NL. At what level should a player actually really pick up your book and get started? I mean, should a 2NL player learn from your book or is it more like 10 and 25 or above? Or, or no, what everyone. Think? To an L player, see, if you're new to the game, I think you could pick up Grinder's Manual and go very slowly through it. When I wrote it, I was trying to sort of make it with the idea that a new poker player can pick it up. That's why at the start I even define very simple things such as, like, what is EV? What is equity? Like, it starts off on that kind of level. But it's also supposed to be written so that an experienced or more experienced player can also pick it up from the beginning and not be bored. So definitely the new player needs to take his time, take notes, um, space it out, basically, and reread a lot of chapters. But I think it should be possible. If you're playing 2NL, I would definitely recommend that you can pick up this book. It starts off with basic stuff in it. It gets more and more complicated quite quickly as, it, as you go through. That's why you've got to take your time with it. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, um, going through your book, you, 
there's it just it is a poker bible i really do i really do believe that but there's one specific chapter on combos and on blockers how right. does somebody who's never even thought of the concept of blockers how do they use that in game and what kind of decisions can blockers help them make okay good question um blockers help you give preference to including one type of hand in your range over another type of hand so they don't definitively make or break a play like a blocker will rarely be like, this is fantastic because I have a blocker in vacuum EV. Like I'm making so many dollars by making this shove because of a blocker. And if I didn't have the blocker, it would be a bad shove. That's not really the case. They're more to help. They're like selection criteria. So if I get three bet and I want to have a four bet frequency against your three betting range, which I do because I want to obviously make you fold and deny you equity sometimes. I want to get money in with good hands and also balance those by bluffing sometimes then what I need to do is choose the right hands to bluff with. I can't just bluff when I've got 8-5 off, because even if you do fold enough for now, in the short term, you're not going to still fold enough if I do it with a range that wide, because I'll be four betting you every single time that you three bet me, basically. So what the blockers do there is they they guide you towards the higher EV hands. Like So me four betting something like ace three suited would be higher EV than me, three, than me four betting jack three suited. And the reason for that is just that by holding that ace, I actually block you from having great hands like aces, ace king, and I might even block some of your lighter continues like ace queen, ace jack suited, and I might even block a five bet bluff from you that'll shove on me, which is bad for me, like ace deuce to ace five suited or something like that. So the ace blocker there gives me more fold equity, not because of anything that I know or you know, but just because naturally it takes away the hands that any normal player would be aggressive with from your range. So blockers are, to summarize, Basically, just they help you select what parts, what types of hand to throw into a range in certain situations, especially when you're bluffing. But they have all kinds of different connotations. And I could ramble all day about this, about like reverse blockers, when you block what you don't want your opponent to have, and that makes it bad um, to call or to bluff or whatever. And you block villain's folding range, so you don't actually want to um, bluff with that combo because you reduce the hands he'll fold. Therefore, he calls you more often, so bluffing's worse. Blockers are really cool. They have a big, big part in GTO. GTO and range building, it's all about using the right blockers in the right situations. That's a huge part of it. So they don't make or break a vacuum play. They don't make something massively higher EV in that one instance, but they guide you towards the right range construction. That would be the best way to say it. Nice, yeah. So they sway your decision possibly one way or the other, and they make plays that seem... Mm, like like a three bet bluff, like you were saying, it 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 could be profitable, but having that ace blocker can make it slightly more profitable. Yeah, and even if you don't know how profitable it will be, you you know it will be more profitable to have the ace blocker. So it might even be that you don't know if you should four bet bluff this guy at all because he's an unknown. But it could be that you're going to sometimes so that you're not totally unbalanced, and you know that the blocker makes it higher EV than not having it. So it doesn't even necessarily guarantee a play is plus EV but it will guarantee you higher EV overall in the long run. Totally. It makes total sense. Yeah, you you had mentioned, uh, you know, with the, with the blocker talk, you talk about three bets and stuff. In, in in your book, you have a full chapter or a section of a chapter dedicated to polar and linear three bets. Can you explain the difference between those? Yeah, so these are actually simplifications of what GTO three betting looks like. Um, but they're good simplifications that also, that, that they, they, they can often work like really well exploitatively. So a linear three betting range is one that is constructed from pocket aces to the worst hand that you want to three bet. So there's no gap here. There's no segregation. Like something like jacks plus ace king, that would be a linear three bet range, albeit a very tight one. Similarly, every single combo possible would be a linear three bet range because it goes from aces to seven deuce up. So linear just means that you don't have two different camps within your range if you like. Linear ranges are normally for value. We use them against weaker players who call too much. We only want to value bet and use good hands to isolate there. We don't want to isolate really like calling station players with 4-3 suited. So we use higher cards generally. That's what linear usually means, higher cards. Um, but they can also just be because we don't want to flat anything. Um, sometimes like we're in a small blind and we think that developing a calling range against the raise is just bad. So we end up just playing linear because we play 3-bet or fold. So we 3-bet the best hands and not the worst ones. It's just common sense. So linear just means there's no gap. We go from aces down to wherever we decide we want to stop three betting, right? Wherever it's going to be too weak to three bet in that situation. Polar is the opposite in that when we're using a polar range, we actually think we've got fold equity or a good amount of it. And we want to have value hands that are strong because if we've got a lot of fold equity, we don't want to three bet some medium strength hand like ace 
jack off, perhaps, if the guy's never calling with worse. We'd be kind of wasting that hand if it would make a good call against the open. We don't want to three bet it for no reason. Um, and because that person is folding a lot to a three bet, we can then throw in bluffs with hands that are too weak to call with. So say you open the button and I think you fold too much. I think you're a huge net and you fold too much to three bets. I don't think that about you really, Sky, but let's say it did. <laughs> then, then I would want to three-bet you with quite a tight value range, right? I'd only want something like, I don't know, jacks plus an ace-king and ace-queen suited perhaps. And I would flat with the next chunk of hands down. i just flat the open. And when I reached the point where the hands were so bad in the hand read that I didn't think I could call your open, that's when I would start three-bet bluffing you. And that way I'm turning hands that I would otherwise have to fold into profitable bluffs, into I'm finding a way to make them profitable defense against your open, if you like. I'm just going to three-bet them um, for fold equity. So polar is all about having two distinct groups of hands, bluffs and value, and those are always separated by hands in the middle that are not good enough for value but not bad enough to be bluffs, which are just calls. And that's the essence of a polarized strategy, and it works well against people who fold too much to three-bets. Absolutely. Nice explanation right there. I really like that. Hopefully that wasn't too quick. I hope that wasn't too like fast and rambly, but no, like, that was like you said, there's a chapter on it, so it's quite it's not the easiest thing to condense in, in a few minutes, but I thought I'd give it a go. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. Well, when it comes to like some of my students, they have uh, you know, very specific leaks and everything. Uh, and they're micro stakes players, my students are. And I of course have my own leaks at the micro stakes. What are the two biggest leaks that micro stakes players have and uh, do you actually dedicate any parts of the grinder's manual to fixing leak or finding and then fixing leaks? Or is it basically just kind of covering the different strategies in different situations throughout the book? Yeah, it's more of the latter. Like I think in the grinder's manual, I'll come to the two biggest ones in a sec. I'll just answer the second part first. I think in the grinder's manual, the idea is that it's a textbook. So it doesn't want to actually say things like, you will have this leak and I'm going to fix that. That would be something I do more in 100 hands and something I'm going to do more in other books that I'm planning. Um, because it's a textbook, it just wants to say this is the right way to do things. And if you can incorporate all of that, you will avoid, you will, ne you will necessarily avoid developing leaks, nice, or at yeah. least you know relevant leaks of the micro stakes, so mm -hmm. or even small stakes. Um, secondly, um, what are the two biggest leaks for beginning players? I mean, there's so many. I, I made a, I've made series for video training sites about like the twenty biggest beginner leaks and things like that. So picking two. It's not totally obvious to me, but I'll just pick two that I think would be up there, right? Um, I think that one of them is going to be this idea that calling is terrible and you must be tight aggressive and you have to be ABC and you have to be folding your blinds because playing out of position is bad. Basically, the whole school of thought that you're afraid of calling out of position or ever doing anything with a call button. That's a very retro kind of old, obsolete school of thought, but a lot of players learn from sources that oversimplify the game and try and teach like some kind of really nitty oversimplified strategy. And then when the student plays like even moves up from two NL to five NL, they can't win because they're folding way too many blinds, folding way too often to three bets, not three betting enough, not winning enough small pots. They've got a low one win soft flop, we would say. Um, and they're just not, they're, they're not, they've got really bad red line, right? Like they're non showdown winnings are terrible because they don't fight for enough small pots. That's definitely one. And if you made me pick another, I would say that neglecting your mental game is huge. It's not a technical leak, but you know, by never working on your mental game, you start to develop a lot of really bad leaks that way um, that you don't even know about. So yeah, yeah, good, good. So we we've discussed a little bit on the mental game, but the whole calling is terrible idea, um, or having the whole three bet or fold uh, right. mentality. How do you how do you go about fixing that if that is a leak in one of your students? Well, first you've got to show them when it's actually correct to think that way. Like when you're in a small blind with an aggressive reg behind you in the big blind, like of course calling is pretty terrible there. Like calling a capped range against a button steal when you're going to get squeezed a lot is really bad. But what I try to show them is how EV actually works in reality. People know what EV means generally. They'll be like, oh yeah, EV is expected value. It just defines like how well I do when I make a decision. But they stop there. So I like to take my students a bit further down the road of understanding EV and say, well, actually, put yourself in the big blind. Imagine the aggressive reg steals on the button for like just over a min open or something like that, or even just call it a min open. That's pretty common these days. And we have a fairly bad hand, like queen six suited. Well, when you decide to call there, you're not actually, you're not supposed to be happy. You're not supposed to be comfortable. 
you're not supposed to have a plan. That's another huge fallacy. Always have a plan as if you can figure out every single possible board and every single possible bet size you're going to face. That's ridiculous. But, you know, you all you need to do there with the queen six suited against the men open is think that by calling, you are losing less than 100 BBs per 100 because that's what will happen if you fold. If you fold, the, from the point of view of the whole hand, you'll lose 100 bigs per 100 by losing one big blind every time it happens, right? So... If you can improve upon that by calling, even if you do fold a lot after the flop, your pot odds make it plus EV. People neglect pot odds. They don't see that if you run this thing a thousand times, there are plenty of times when you do actually win the pot with the queen six here against this wide range in some way. Maybe fold equity, maybe getting there, maybe semi-bluffing a flush draw, whatever. There's a lot of people. The problem is that the student automatically relates discomfort to playing a bad strategy when the two are not actually the same thing. Discomfort's just you don't you're not used to doing that. You're your comfort zone. It doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. And I think you have to disconnect those two things, you know, the discomfort from this is minus EV. Gotcha. That's gonna take some work for somebody who's developed this as a habit for such a long time. I'm gonna fold all my big blinds unless it's ace jack suited or or pocket sevens, you know. It it probably yeah. takes a while to get them to break that habit. Yeah, they're very uncomfortable and, you know, you need to, like, make a big impact, I find, as a coach. Like, you need to, say, draw a graph of, like, the EV, what, what I think the EV is of calling and then show them what's happening when they're folding and actually, like, visually show it to them and try and scare the crap out of them, basically, and make them change their ways. That's a good way to go as well. Nice. All right. Well, speaking of leaks, um, I know you said Grinder's Manual doesn't necessarily address them but your other book 100 hands does occasionally so who is 100 hands for is it for the same six max online player or is it a more general book it is still online six max cash um but it applies a lot to like i think it's less hud based so 100 hands doesn't go into loads of detail about huds um it doesn't it has them just for a general sense of player type sometimes but it doesn't rely on them in any way and what 100 Hands does is it basically gets you to think first. It's a quiz book, first and foremost. So it basically says, um, right, you have a shot at this hand. Try and critique my student's line. Some of the hands are played by my students. And the reader is supposed to say what he thinks, basically, at least mentally. Maybe write it down of the student's line and then critique it a bit. Then he'll read me critiquing the student's play and see if he, was, if he did a good job as coach, as it were. And the other kind of hands are played by myself or they're engineered as if they're played by me. And the student needs to try and understand what I'm doing and then try and figure out what I'm going to do in the final decision point of the hand, which is always with a question mark, like hero is going to do what now, basically. So that's how the book is structured. It's definitely for people who have got a decent grasp of of the fundamentals, who have read the Grinders Manual preferably um, and are at a reasonable level. Like They don't need to be playing like 100 or 200 NL online or anything like that. Um, they can still be playing micro stakes, but they need to be able to think in terms of ranges they need to understand a little bit about what game theory optimal plays are based on, or, what, or at least what GTO kind of is, which is explained in the Grounders Manual. And then the book tries to teach them a bit more about like game theory and, and things like that and just solve practical problems. Like A lot of people said after Grounders Manual, like they said, I wish there were more problems, like I wish there were more hand examples. And so that's why I wrote 100 Hands. It's not a direct follow-on because it builds in complexity and it does teach a lot of new things. So it's not just a quiz book for Grounders Manual. But it is in part, in part, that's what it is. And it's also like taking the theory level from Grounders Manual and it's like advancing it a little bit. So I'd say that it helps if you've read Grounders Manual before you read 100 Hands. Yeah, I bet it does. Yeah, I haven't picked up 100 Hands yet, but I definitely will, especially after that explanation. Sounds really good just going cool. through hands like that. Is it is it formatted in a way like, you know, I don't know, first, zero, uh, first one through 10 hands are all pre flop and then, uh, you know, 11 through 20 are all three bet hands. I mean, do you have it kind of going in kind of a linear fashion to teach a full, well-rounded game? Actually, I don't, right? And the reason for that is that, let me actually, if I may, if you don't mind, can I read you the kind of, you know, in the back of the book, it says a little bit what the book's about, whatever that's called. I should probably know that as an author, right? But I've said here on my website, imagine you've just sat down to play a session of Six Max Cash online. Now imagine that the next 100 hands that you play are all fascinating and difficult spots. Then imagine that time has been slowed down to the extent that you can think for as long as you want on each hand and perform as vigorous an analysis as you possibly can. Like, I stop quoting here. Imagine that, right? Imagine you could actually freeze time and think for like 15 minutes about a spot and then play it. How cool would that be? 
Uh, like playing and then session. The, the next hand, like hand number one, then hand number two, you're supposed to imagine that this is one big session. So right. like you're in, your position changes hand by hand, right? Through yeah, but it's, it doesn't actually go like that as in you're moving around the table. It's more of like a Zoom format where you're oh, just right. randomly placed all the time. You know, you're not necessarily moving around the table. The players are not the same. They, they, they change in and out. So it's meant to kind of emulate like a Zoom session, I guess. Okay. And then I'll quote the final part. Finally, imagine an expert standing over your shoulder. That's me. You know, I like to flatter myself just a little bit. Um, I don't, you can um, imagine that, right? Any any good coach standing over your shoulder, ready to show you a detailed analysis of each hand right after you've completed your own attempt to solve the spot. Welcome to 100 hands, the longest and most instructive poker session of your life because every hand needs to be thought about for ages, right? That's the point. So I guess I was trying to say, with 100 hands, I was trying to like do something about the fact that there's a big, big gap between theory and practice. And if you just look at things in a structured way, the brain then struggles to make sense of the random scattering of hands that are of identifying the situations that are dealt to you when you sit down and play a session. You don't get all the three bet spots in a row, right? You get like a scattering of everything where you have to identify the theme. So 100 hands is random. The hands are not in any ranking of difficulty. It's just like you have to use your abilities that you've picked up in Grinders Manual or in other sources, and you have to apply them to these random puzzles. Nice. That's the idea. Yeah, so it simulates like a real-world situation, like you said, playing exactly. Zoom. Do you recommend... That was, yeah. oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that was the idea, at least. I hope it does that. Yeah, Yeah, I like that. That's a great idea. I love it. Um, uh, do, you, do you recommend players play Zoom? I love Zoom. Um, I think it's fantastically fun because you don't have to wait about. You don't have to mess around trying to find tables the thing with zoom is that there's two problems with it potential things that could go wrong they're not necessarily problems they're just things to be aware of one is that the game is so fast-paced and you can go on quite big swings a lot faster than you do at regular tables because you're playing so many more hands per hour and that can tell people that can be like wow i just lost four buy-ins in 10 minutes that doesn't yeah. normally happen at regular tables so that's one thing you need to prepare your mental game for that a little bit and the second thing is that it depends what kind of player you are. If your GTO is very, very weak and you don't intend on improving your GTO and you don't intend on learning what good base strategies look like in theory, then Zoom is not a good idea because you don't have enough info to just table select and hard out exploit your opponents. You don't normally have enough info to do that um, unless you're playing a higher stakes pool, in which case they won't have many leaks to exploit anyway. So the pools are huge, that's the point. You don't get a lot of info. Um, so if you're like a really exploitatively minded player, um, and all you really want to do is be like, oh, look, I've observed all these tendencies and I'm going to try and beat this guy by playing hyper-exploitatively, then you're probably better off table selecting regular tables and finding weak opponents, mm -hmm. and that's fine if that's what you want to do. But if you're really interested in honing your GTO, which I think is necessary these days, you know, the community's kind of settled on the fact that you don't have to use GTO all the time, but you do have to have some idea of what it looks like in some common spots at least so you can go out in that direction. Zoom is great for honing that because you'll so often not have that much info. Another thing Zoom's really good for is picking up on subtle clues. Like this guy, men opened from the hijack. That is not a normal behavior for a reg. And then just bearing in mind for the rest of that hand that that's probably a weaker player. It's going to be valuable and it'll help you pick the best line. So these are the advantages of Zoom, but there's a couple of pitfalls, but they're not like deal breakers for me. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I've never, I've never had to, I've never been fortunate enough to play Zoom or any any kind of poker like that really right um yeah. you know i just don't have poker stars and some of the other sites that offer it i'm not on those sites you know so it's interesting yeah. to hear your take i hear a lot of different coaches say that um you know stay away from zoom tables because you cannot table select you can't get position uh you know position is random the opponents yeah. are random but yeah I, I like what you said and the whole the idea behind using zoom to practice practice your gto skills that's killer that's the first time i've ever heard that i love it yeah, it does work well as a training device for that. But another thing is that just be, like you do have a lower, of course you have a lower BB per 100 when you play Zoom relative to playing like a regular table that you've selected. Like of course you're going to win more money per 100 hands against targeted, don't want to say bum hunted, but you know like weaker players that you've sought out or at least like you've only gone on tables that contain at least two weak players or something like that. You're going to do better BB per 100, but you're going to play a lot more hands per hour playing Zoom. So the question is, you know, does that really matter? Because you can make money and you can improve your hourly in two ways. One, by having a really high EV per hand. And secondly, with a lower EV per hand with more hands per hour. 
Zoom gives you the latter. So it's not necessarily less profitable. It is profitable in a different way, and it is a bit higher variance because the BB per 100 win rate is lower. Totally. That makes a lot of sense. Wow, you know that? Well, you know, Peter, I want to thank you very much for your time today. This has been an awesome interview, and I'm sure everything that you've been saying is so valuable to me, and I'm sure it's valuable to the audience as well. Thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate it. You're very welcome, man. You know, I love poker, so I'm happy to talk about it all the time. So for me, it's just fun to to ramble on about poker. And I'm just glad there's people that listen to me. So thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, definitely. How, um, if somebody does want to pick up the Grinders Manual or 100 Hands, I know uh, Grinders Manual is available on Amazon for Kindle, but both books are on CarrotCorner.com as well, right? Right. And this is where I'll do my kind of, not anti-Amazon plug, but basically if you want to support like humble poker coaches who slave away behind their own keyboard all the time and <laughs> authors right best way to buy it is through my website and through the the gumroad company who handle the sale because i pay them a little subscription you know it's great good for authors i'd recommend it you know if you want to like publish your own kind of stuff then gumroad is one way to do it if you don't want to build your own like sales mechanism um and that's really good because it means that i keep most of the money from the sale now, when you buy on Amazon, they take an enormous amount of the royalties, and that's just because they're huge and they give you publicity. And you know what you what you miss out on in royalties, you gain back to some extent because they give you so much exposure because everyone searches there. Um, but for me, if you're listening to this podcast and you want to pick up one of my books, firstly, fantastic, thank you so much, I appreciate the support. Please buy it via my website, carrotcorner.com. Click the Gumroad link there, very secure connection. It just allows you to to buy it instantly, and you'll get a PDF sent out to you right away and then if you also want a kindle version well i own that it's on my computer it doesn't belong to amazon i can provide you with one as well um if you have bought the pdf so you can actually get both versions if you want if you buy the pdf but i won't supply a pdf to people who buy kindle because i don't make very much in the kindle to be honest so that's my preference if you want to help support me as an author and help me write more books in the future you know Totally, totally. And uh, for the audience, I'll have links to everything that we talk about today at, uh, at the show notes for today's, uh, today's podcast so they can find them there. Or, of course, go to carrotcorner.com. Nice and simple as well. Um, and I'm really looking forward to some more podcast episodes from you. You have the Carrot Poker Podcast. Right. And, you know, you were putting out some episodes leading up to the launch of 100 Hands. But when that book came out, you stopped putting out episodes. Are we going to hear more? Yes, absolutely. That was kind of burnout, you know, when you push for a deadline, mm -hmm. self-imposed deadline, and then you get there and you're like, now I will stop thinking about poker for a while and just become a zombie. So I did that, you know, because I'd worked so hard finishing that book. Um, and the podcast sadly stopped because I just didn't have the, at the end of the year after I turned that book out, I didn't really have the motivation to to keep doing it. But now it's a new year and I'm on a huge like publicity push this year where I just want to like, I want to get as much exposure as I can. So the podcast is back from next week when I've got a, a cool guest coming on who's actually a guy that I coach who plays 1020 and 2550 high stakes Ooh. online. And he actually took a break from the game. He left the game at Black Friday like so many of us did, um, or so many of you guys in, in the States, I should say, did, and then um, came back to the game last year so he took like a six seven year hiatus and jumped straight back into high stakes how did that go for him you know yeah kind of weird thing to do right but mm -hmm. we'll talk about that on the on the next podcast episode guy called chris so um that's my first one and i want to get more interesting guests and stuff on this year so absolutely the podcast will be back and i will do my best to to keep it up regularly for for everyone who who likes it Awesome. I'm looking forward to hearing that. And so for the listeners, that's Carrot Poker. You can get on iTunes or anywhere else, uh, you know, podcasts are available. You can also find uh, Peter. He had mentioned the Poker Stars School, and uh, that's actually a Twitch channel. And I'll have a link in the show notes. But uh, on Twitch, if you just search Poker Stars School, you'll find quite a few different videos from Peter as well as a lot of other coaches right there. And um, also uh, your email address, if people want to get in contact with you about your books or uh, to inquire as to coaching the email is admin at carrotcorner.com right absolutely and i'm like uh i don't have like filtering like where my emails get sorted by anyone i don't have a secretary i tried to get my girlfriend to be my secretary but she won't <laughs> you know, what, what can i do I'll, 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 I'll keep trying you know i'll keep uh -huh. trying maybe like maybe get her fired from her job or something like that you know engineer that so that she, i can get her working for me maybe but um but the point is that all the Joking aside, the point is that all the emails come directly to me and I make a point of replying to them like as quickly as I can, usually within a day. So if you have any questions about coaching, you're interested in coaching, you're interested in the books, you know, you've bought the PDF and now you want the Kindle, just email me and I'll get back to you like really quickly. I'm not one of these guys that 
you know, it sets for like two weeks and then I'll be like, oh, so sorry, I've been busy. I tend to avoid that as much as possible. So just shoot me an email, just like you would your friend or whatever, and I'll get back to you as fast as I can. Awesome. Well, once again, Peter, thank you so much for your time today. I really do appreciate it. It was great having you on the show. You're very welcome. It's an honor to have been on the show, and hopefully I'll come back at some point in the future to, to go over more stuff for the end of the year. That'd be cool. Well, yeah, your first course, definitely. Yeah, be good. All right, man. <laughs> Thanks very much. Cheers. Yep, cheers. Take care. Thank you so much for listening today, and of course, a very special thanks to Peter Clark for joining us on today's episode. He dropped a ton of killer knowledge on us right there, so I hope, and actually, I trust all of you really did enjoy that episode. Uh, make sure you go to carrotcorner, carrotcorner.com and visit Peter, check out his stuff, subscribe to the Carrot Poker Podcast. Uh, you know, he should be coming out with a new episode next week, and of course, be on the lookout for a future PowerPoint course from him and uh when he does create it i'll have him back on the show for sure i'm putting out more episodes now so make sure you enable my alexa flash briefing skill just search for smart poker study in the amazon alexa store and of course subscribe to the show in itunes or your favorite pod catching app if you can type the word smart poker study you can find me on twitch youtube facebook instagram and twitter and if you have any questions send them my way sky at smartpokerstudy.com Alrighty, poker peeps, next week in episode 175, I will finally discuss what I learned through playing 263 Heads Up Sit and Go matches in December. If you've been waiting for this episode, because I think I've mentioned it two or three times over the past two weeks, um, you know, no longer will you have to wait. I guarantee next week, episode 175 will come out, and I'll be talking Heads Up Sit and Goes. Word of mouth is the best advertising, so muchas gracias for sharing the show with other poker people. Your sharing and caring is what helps us grow. Until next time, study smart, play much, and make your next session the best one yet.